Good morning, everybody. If you please stand and turn to 301 in your hymn books on the victory side. Ready, Miss Oh, okay, here we go. On the victory side, on the victory side. No fear can daunt me, no fear can haunt me on the victory side, on the victory side, on the victory side. With Christ within, the fight will win on the victory side. Amen. Now to turn to hymn number 323, Standing on the Promises. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. Huh? Say it again, 323, hymn number 323. Like that? Twice? Okay. <laughs> Two. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Verse 2 Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Verse 4 Standing on the promises I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all and all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Thank you. Now we have a welcome in prayer. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody here this morning. Now we're going to have a great day. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what's good to be in the house of God today. And uh, I'm glad everybody's here. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this, the Lord's day, that we can come into your house and we can worship as we please. Father, we just thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for what you did on the cross for our sin. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct every aspect of this service. that will be for your honor and your glory. Pray for those who are away from us today. We just pray that you'd be with them, bring them back again next week. We just thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if you will, turn with me to hymn number 43. 43. 43. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Verse 2. For my part in this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For 
This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen, amen. You do announcements? Go ahead. All right, now I get to do announcements. Ha ha. Uh, let's see, what is today? The, anyway, okay, uh, June 12th, we have Teens Under God's Guidance. That's for teenagers. Uh, June 20th, Men's and Ladies Fellowship. Also, June 20th will be a fishing trip. Uh, June 21st is, of course, Father's Day. Uh, make it here if you can. It's going to be good. Uh, June 26th is uh, Teens Under God's Guidance again. June 28th, we'll have a noisy bucket. Uh, July 1st will be Questions and Answers Night. Those are fun, so bring all your questions from your Bible readings. And July 4th is Men's Breakfast here at the church at 8 o'clock. Uh, July 5th is a Patriotic Sunday. That's going to be a good one, too. Uh, July 10th is Teens Under God's Guidance again. Uh, July 18th, Men's and Ladies Fellowship. July 19th, Church Picnic. Uh, July 24th, Teens Under God's Guidance. And July 26th, Noisy Bucket. Uh, it's good to see this filling back up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Dunn. Oh. Right? oh, bring your credit card. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies fellowship's going to be at, uh, I can, that's this next one. Oh, oh no. So, uh, that's this one, right? June 20th, June 20th, men, uh, ladies fellowship will be going to Ikea. Ikea. Anyway, I'm just teasing. Uh, if you all would, uh, for the course of the month, if you'd stand up with us and, and turn to hymn number 261. 261, stand and sing, and then we'll turn around and wave hi to everybody. And we'll do our offering after that. <laughs> He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted and set the captives free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Amen. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Give everybody a note. One more time. He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted and set the captives free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Amen.
Thank you. Uh, now get it in a different gear. And no, I'm kidding. Piano's three. Anyways, if you uh, if y'all turn with me to hymn number eighty-five, uh, this is a breathing song. Can get you going. Juice is flowing. Just over in glory land, hymn number 85. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. How you doing, Miss Storm? home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land and i long to be by my savior's side just over in the glory land just over in the glory land i'll join the happy angel band over in the glory land just over in the glory land there with the mighty host i'll stand just over in the glory land verse two i am on my way to those mansions fair just over in the glory land there to sing god's praise and his glory share just over in the glory land just over in the glory land i'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over in the glory land there with the mighty host i'll stand just over in the glory land verse four with the blood washed throng i will shout and sing just over in the glory land Glad Hosanna, the Lord of the North is King, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there when the mighty host all stand, just over in the glory land. Amen. Thank y'all very, very much. Uh, now we have a uh, no. Do we have any special music tonight? No. no? Okay. Uh, message. <laughs> oh, hey, junior church gone. No juniors. No juniors. <laughs> no. I just preferred your table. I'll go there. Okay. I'll go. Luke. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go to uh, junior church today. Amen. And I'll let somebody else preach. Amen. All right, let's take and uh, if you have your Bibles, and I want to encourage people to have your Bibles because today, if you don't have any paper, you need some because I want you to take notes today. I've got some things that uh, everybody needs to be taking notes on because it's something that I've not preached on for some time. In fact, I don't think I've preached on this probably for 10 or 15 years, and, um, and I'm going to show you why here in just a little bit. But um, if you've got your Bibles, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The title of this morning's message is Friends or Foes. Friends or Foes. And uh, you want to take, and um, I guarantee that you're going to want to take some notes on this because I've got some very important things in here that um, uh, I feel are important not only for uh, me as a pastor, but also for you as a church, because uh, you need to know what the Bible says about certain things and why it says it. And uh, someday I'm not going to be here, and you need to be able to go back to the Bible and say, wait a minute, pastor, preach on this. Is it, this is what this is all about. But first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, if you don't have your Bible, you can look up on, this, on the monitors and and Jacob will put it up there. Starting in verse number 14, it says, be ye, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but what, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will deliver, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct in this message today. It's a very important message, and I just pray that we might get out of it what we need. We just thank you so much for loving us. We thank you now for this time that we can open your word and see what you have for us. I just pray that we all might get the little golden nuggets out of this message that we need. Father, I just pray now that you'll help us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, many times I make decisions. And sometimes I blow people off. I hate to say it that way. Uh, ask Nancy, she'll tell you that. You know, people ask me questions and I'll say, well, it's in the church constitution. That's why we do it this way. Well, if you look at the church constitution, you'll see that I'm the one who wrote the church constitution <laughs> and it was the church that voted on it. So needless to say, it, uh, um, it's, you know, pretty much what I said the Bible says about certain things. But I wanna, I've been asked many, many times why certain people cannot have certain jobs in the church. Why is it that so-and-so or such-and-such can't teach in the school? Why is it so-and-so or such-and-such can't be in charge of the food bank? Why is it um, uh, so-and-so or such-and-such can't have a leadership position in the church? And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about a little bit, because I feel that uh, we need to look biblically, biblically at the leadership of the local New Testament church. You know, <clears throat> I would like to use a lot of people in leadership positions in the church. However, the Bible is very explicit about who can and who cannot hold positions in the uh, local New Testament church. And I want to talk to you this morning about that a little bit. You know, uh, in the scripture that we just read, and other scriptures that we're going to be looking at this morning, I feel that we're going to have a little better idea of why I have the convictions I do on certain things in the church. You know, I have my preferences, but then I have my convictions that I can back up by the Word of God, and I'm going to stand firm on them. And I want you to understand that. Um, you know, I, I think that all of us, uh, realize that, that, you know, I can't run the church by myself. I need to have help. I got to have help in the food bank. I got to have help in the school. I got to have help um, janitorial. I got to have help for all kinds of things in the church. And I can't do it myself. But there's also a very distinct line between people that can help and people that can't help or that can have leadership responsibility or cannot have leadership responsibility in the local New Testament church. And I want you to take notes on this because um, someday down the road, you're going to say, well, you know, pastor talked about leadership responsibility in the church, and I know I've got notes somewhere on it, and you need to take and know where they are because someday I may not be here, and uh, you may say, well, you know, we need to do it this way. This is the way it needs to be done because that's the way the Bible says. Now, the first thing is this. We are not to be yoked together with unbelievers. You know, if you take and you look at uh, verse 14, it says, um, <clears throat> Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? But what does it mean to be yoked together? In Webster's uh, Dictionary of 1923, uh, the meaning is this, to couple, to join with another. Uh, I want you to keep this in mind for just a minute. To couple or to join with another. To couple or to join with another. Now, uh, I want you to, to think about this for just a minute. 
in the days of the Bible, and even today, in poorer nations, um, even in, in the United States, in the Amish community, what do they use to plow fields and get crops and things like that? They use either oxen or they use horses, don't they? Okay, back in the, in the Bible times, they did the same thing. They use oxen or they use horses or whatever. And so what they did is they had a yoke on them. How many of you know what a yoke is? Good, then I'm not going to explain it. No, um, but what it is is a piece of wood between two animals, and they're, they're coupled together that way. Now, the reason they do that is because two are stronger than one, okay? And they can get more of the job done with two rather than one. And they would put this big chunk of, uh, of wood between them, and they couple them together, and the way they would go down the field. Now, um, what would happen if one of them decided it wanted to go this way and the other one wanted to go this way? That big chunk of wood would keep them together. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a, a young boy, we, would, uh, uh, we had a farmer that, that used horses. And I was out with him and uh, I was watching him, you know, with these horses. Well, all of a sudden, one horse wanted to go to the left and the other horse wanted to go straight. Well, that didn't work at all. His furrow was going like this there down the, uh, down the um, field. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's a lot of work in that. There's a lot of work trying to keep those horses going, both of them down the same, same way. Well, you know, that's the same way with, with uh, being yoked together. You know, the Bible says that we're not supposed to be yoked together or we're not supposed to be hooked together with unbelievers. Well, what exactly is it talking about? What exactly is the Bible talking about uh, being yoked, yoked together? Well, I'm glad you, you asked that question. You know, what Paul is telling all of us here is that we're not to be yoked together with unbelievers or try to be one in the Lord with unbelievers. Now, um, teenagers, they get really upset with me. Because I tell them, I said, now, make sure that you know the person that you're dating is a Christian. Make sure you know that they are on their way to heaven or don't date them. Well, why? We're just good friends. What happens when a male and a female are together as good friends? They become lovers. And guess what? It isn't long and they decide to get married. Now, what's happening is they're being yoked together through marriage. One's a Christian, one's a non-Christian. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, don't yoke yourself together with unbelievers. Don't yoke yourself together with people who are not the same as what you are. Don't hook yourself together with someone else. Let's take a look at the business world for a minute. Now, I was in business for many, 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 many years. And when I started my commodity business in, in uh, Apache Junction, I was working with two people. One was in uh, Chicago. The other one was up in Detroit, Michigan. And we would work together moving um, uh, dairy products from the East Coast to the West Coast, South to the North. And I mean, you know, we're just moving stuff all over the place. But I became so convicted that they were not Christians. They weren't, they just weren't Christians. They were not believers. And I became so convicted of that, that I had to split away from them. That I had to split totally away from them. Why? Because I was being yoked together with them in the same company, and it really, really convicted me. So as soon as I did that, my business went crazy and, and I made a little bit of money. And uh, so, but what we need to realize is we need to take and be careful that we do not yoke ourselves together with unbelievers or we don't yoke ourselves together with non-Christians. Well, how does this work in the church then? You know, let's look at the base of the church. You know, there's a lot of good people out there who may have good intentions and have great abilities to do things in the church. However, they are not like us. They're not like us. You know, they're not uh, the, the way we are. In their church, 
or whatever church they go to, you know, the beliefs that they have are, may not be or are not in accordance with the Word of God. And these are the questions that I ask myself when somebody asks me if they can do this or that and everything else. Does the church that you go to believe in salvation by grace or do you believe in a work salvation? What I mean by that is, do they believe that all you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved? Or do you have to do certain things in order to get him? Do you have to be baptized as a baby? Do you have to uh, take the, uh, um, the sacrament of, of communion? Do you have to do this? Do you have to do that? That's a work salvation. Now, do you have to do that? Or is it saved by grace? Another thing is, do you believe in baptism by immersion or do you believe in inf infant baptism? Do you believe in a man, God, or do you believe in the true God? Do you pray to a statue or do you pray to the true God? Do you depend on a man to forgive your sins or do you have an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, between you and God the Father? Do you believe that um, the Lord's Supper can have saving grace. And believe it or not, there's an awful lot of churches that believe that. They believe it's a sacrament. And what a sacrament is, is it, it deems saving grace. There's an awful lot of uh, uh, religions that believe that when you take the Lord's Supper, the bread turns into the body of Christ, and the cup turns into his blood as soon as you eat it or drink it. That's not what it is. And they believe that by taking that, it will take your sins away from you. That's not what it's all about. What the Lord's Supper is, is a picture. That's all it is, is a picture. The same way as baptism is a picture of what Christ did for us. If you take and you look at the, the bread, the bread is what? The body of Christ. It shows what he did. He gave his body as a sacrifice for you and I. The cup represents his blood, and it's the blood that he shed for the remission of our sins. It doesn't save us. I can take the Lord's Supper ten times a day, and it's not going to get me any closer to heaven. You know, I can go into the water of baptism twice, three, four, especially in the summertime when it's hot, just to cool off. But uh, uh, I can go into the baptism tank four or five days or times a day, and it won't get me any closer to heaven. What baptism is, is a picture of Christ's death as we stand in the water, his burial as we go underneath the water, and his resurrection as we come out of the water. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's what baptism's all about. There's no saving grace in it at all. You can get wet as, you know, if you're not saved and you get baptized, you know what you come out as? A wet sinner. That's what you come out as, is a wet sinner. And what we need to realize is that we need to be careful that the people that we have in leadership roles in the church have the same beliefs as we do. Because things can creep in really fast into a church. That's why I'm very careful about who I have deals with, so to speak, for the food bank. I'm very careful about um, what we do as far as contracts and things like that in the food bank. You know, if our beliefs are not stacked up to what we believe, then what this church, uh, um, this church is going to be unequally yoked with something that we shouldn't be. And we're going to be hooked together with something that we don't believe in. And that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we understand and know what other people believe. The second thing is this. The first thing was uh, we need to take and uh, um, uh, we shouldn't be yoked together. The second thing is this. But what do we want taught in our church? What do we want taught in our church? You know, in John chapter 15 and verse 19, it says this. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore... The world hateth you. Now, when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we were taken out of what? What were we taken out of? 
Boy, I hope you guys are really awake this morning because i got lots of questions for you as I go through this message. I really do. But what were we saved out of? The world. We were saved out of the world. We were sa saved out of the sin of this world. Right. We were, we were set apart from the world, weren't we? You know, the minute that we asked the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart, we were set apart um, uh, from the world. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that ye are washed, that ye are sanctified, that ye are justified. Now, what that means is we are washed, our sins were washed away, we were sanctified or we were set apart, and that we are justified in God's eyes. We became just like Jesus in God's eyes the very moment that we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Now, <clears throat> what we need to realize is that we are not of this world anymore and that we are, um, uh, uh, that we are not to love the things of this world. You know, uh, I think of the song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I don't feel at home in this world anymore. And you know, that's what we need to be looking at, is that we're not in this world anymore. The once we get saved, we're not part of the world. If you look at 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 to 17, <clears throat> it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, <clears throat> we may be in this world living here, and all of us are, aren't we? All of us are living in this world, aren't we? However, we're not to be of the world. You know, there's a difference in living in the world and being of the world. And now, once we get saved, we need to realize that we do not need to be of this world. Now, <clears throat> you may say, well, well, preacher, I, I guess I don't really understand what you're saying. You know, what kind of testimony do other people have that are going to be in the church and we allow in a leadership role, whether it's be in Sunday school or, or uh, school or whatever it be, what kind of an influence are they going to have on our children if they're in the world and they're not out of the world? They haven't been separated from the world. They haven't been sanctified. You know, what are they going to teach our children? You know, before you're saved, Sin is a natural occurrence. Did you know that? Sin is a natural occurrence the, before we're saved. Before we're saved, we'll do like everybody else does. You know, I, I was watching the uh, news and watching the looting and everything that's going on in Minneapolis and, and uh, Scottsdale and other places like that. Well, what caused them to do that? Sin. Now, did they have to do it? They chose to do it, didn't they? Isn't that what sin is all about? Choosing to do sin. You know, if a person wants to go out drinking, you know, you have to choose to do that, don't you? If a person's going to do drugs, you have to choose to do that. If a person's going to go and loot a store, you have to choose to do that. It just doesn't come naturally. It's not a natural thing. The natural thing is to stay away from that. But we choose to do it. And you know, that's the problem with so many people. Uh, they, they live in the world and they think, well, this is just normal because everybody does it. They don't have that new life in them that only Christ can give us. Once we're saved, we are a new creature. We are a peculiar people. People say, man, you're weird. I know I am. I'm a Christian, amen? You know, 
I don't think they mean that that way, but then again, you know, you never can tell. But <clears throat> what we need to realize is what kind of testimony do these people have on our children or what kind of influence are they going to have on them? If they're not saved, if they're not born again, and they're in the school teaching our kids, what kind of an influence are they going to have on our children? You know, um, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You know, what we need to realize is this, is that the Bible shows us what we need to do. The Bible knows who we should, or shows us who we should be friends with, who we shouldn't be friends with, who we should have in the church, who we shouldn't have in the church. Well, let's take a look at the rest of this <clears throat> before we run out of time. But what about biblical separation? This is the third thing. You may want to write this down. What about biblical separation? What about separation? Now, we just talked about being yoked, right? Now, we're going to be looking at something else. Paul uses two different things here in these verses. The first thing he says, you're yoked together as partners, right? That's what he's talking about in the first part. Now, he's talk, going to talk about biblical separation. If you take and you look at verses 14 through 16, Paul gives examples of what being yoked together means. And we read through that. But let's look at the part that is called separation, or what I call biblical separation. And we're going to look at two different things here. And I want to show you the, the, the uh, continuity between the two of them. In Isaiah 52, 11, it says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch not no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, and bear the vessel of the Lord. Now, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. I want to show the comparison between these two. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, if you look at these two verses together in context, you'll see that Isaiah was talking to the children of Israel in Isaiah. Bring, um, bring Isaiah back up again, will you please? Go back one. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's the wrong one. Can you bring the other one up? Yeah, this is it. Okay. If you take and you look at this, it says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out of, from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, and bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, Isaiah is talking directly to the Israelites here. He's saying, Depart from evil. Be separate from it. Separate yourself from it. Get away from it. Now, go back to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians. 14, I think it is. There, no. Nope. Yeah, well, that's okay. Leave it there. But see, wherefore, come out from them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, notice the two of them are almost identical. One was written by Isaiah back in the Old Testament. One was written by Paul in the New Testament. And now Paul is not talking to Israel. Who is Paul talking to here? Huh? The church. That's who he's talking to. He's writing to the church of Corinth. But he's writing to all churches. That includes us. He said, listen, you need to be separate. He's not talking about being yoked together here. He's talking about being separate. And you're going to see this as we get through this a little bit more. But he's saying we need to be separated from this. <clears throat> but what does it mean to be separated? You know, we have to live in the same world as everybody else, don't we? 
We have to shop at the same Walmarts as everybody else. We have to go to the same shops, right? Amen. Shops got the best meat. Amen. Anyway, um, you know, we need to take and realize that we eat at the same restaurants as everybody else. We're in the world. We're in the world. And we have to live in the world. However, we do not have to be of the world. You know, we, what does it mean to be separated? Social distancing. Amen? No. Spiritual distancing. You know, there's a difference between social distancing and spiritual distancing. What we need to realize is that we need to be spiritually distanced from those who do not believe as we do and what the Bible says. We need to distance ourselves from them. And, I mean, yeah, you got to be around them. Yeah, you got to be at the same place as shopping and things like that. But we did not have to go to the same place as they go. We don't have to go to the bars. We don't have to go to the drug houses. We don't have to go to the casinos. We don't have to go to the uh, uh, movie theaters. We don't have to go to the, uh, um, and watch um, the same shows they do on TV. We don't have to play certain games on our phones. We don't have to go to the same websites. We need to be careful who we talk to on social media. Man, I'll tell you what, social media is some of the worst things I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't know how many, how many people I've befriended in the last three weeks just because of the language that they use on social media. I can't stand it. You know, what is your opinion for other people's property? You know, these are things that we need to be asking ourselves about other people. You know, go through this list and see where you stack up. Then go through the list again and see where your friends stack up. If they stack up the same as you do or if they stack up differently. You know, for those who have known me for any length of time, know that there's some things I will not put up with in the church. You know, I don't like swearing. I don't. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. And you know, it's amazing how all of a sudden people will be talking and they just let her slip. <gasps> Whoop, I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm not your resident Holy Spirit, but don't swear around me. After all, I serve a great God and I will separate from those who will not guard their tongue. Period. It's just the way I am. You know, I don't like thieves. Thou shalt not steal. You know, I separate myself from them. Why? Because they take my stuff. They're thieves. You know, anyone who does not have the appearance as a Christian in their walk and their talk, believe it or not, I separate from. I do. I separate from them. Why? Because I don't want my testimony tarnished. I don't want someone else bringing my testimony down. So I'll take and say, okay, you stay over there. But how do you gauge who you should be separated from? Have you ever thought about that? How do you gauge it? You may want to write this verse down. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, guess who's telling, who's telling this? Jesus. Jesus says, hey, listen to me very careful. By their fruits, you shall know them. Well, we need to look at a person's spiritual life. You know, is there any spiritual growth? Or is there any spiritual fruit? Do you have the desire to come to church? Or would you rather just stay home 
and watch it live stream. You know, I know Dana can't come and he would want to be here. He wants to be here so bad, but he can't because of this virus going on. And this does not pertain to him one tiny bit. But there's an awful lot of people today that are sitting home watching the live stream that should be here. They should. You know, what, is, what kind of spiritual life are you living? You know, are they in the Word of God? Or do they just give lift service? How is their daily walk with the Lord? Are they walking like everybody else? Or are they walking a separated life? You know, what we need to understand is this. If a person is not uh, of us, they are uh, against us. Right? And we need to be so careful. You know, most of what I just shared are those of the world. However, there are some that will creep into a church unknowingly. And we need to be so careful. I'm going to tell you a story. Just quite a few years ago, we had a couple that came to church. They had two little girls. And uh, that's when we ran MTC and we had our youth activities and things like that. And uh, he wanted to work so bad in MTC and junior church. I mean, he wanted to work there so bad. And I said, no, because we have a six-month rule. You've got to be in church, a member of the church, in good standing for six months before you can work in MTC, before you could work in the youth, before you could work in junior church, and before you could work in the school. Those four things, you had to be here for six months so that I had a good idea of what you believed and what your walk was with the Lord. Six months gives me a pretty good idea. Five months rolled around. He was here all the time. He was here when we were remodeling this here. He was here doing a lot of different things. He was working over at the prison. And, and uh, I mean, he's a really nice guy and everything else. But there were just, I don't know, something about him that just didn't make sense. Because he kept asking, well, when can I start working with the kids? When, I can, when can I start doing this and that and everything else? So his six months was coming up. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed about it. And just before his six months was up, all of a sudden... The police pulled in, and uh, they said, hey, do you know where so-and-so lives? And I said, yeah. So I took him over to the house, and there was nobody there. I mean, there was nobody there. All their clothes were there. Their furniture was there. Everything was there, but they were gone. They were totally, 100% gone. They left everything. I mean, it looked like they left overnight. And so I, I said, well, I said, this is where they live. And they said, okay. So about a month later, I get an envelope in the mail. And in there is a newspaper clipping from up in Williams, um, Arizona. And here it was of him and that he had been arrested for child molestation of a minor. Now, let me tell you something. This was a good man. You know, he helped at the church all the time. I mean, he was here constantly. He wanted to do everything he possibly could in the church. But there was a dark side to him, too. You know, a lot of times I do things... Not to protect myself, but to protect the church. And that's why we need to realize that we need to keep ourselves separate from those who, they may appear to be good, but what's their fruit say? What kind of fruit do they have? You know, are they living day to day as they look in church? Or are they living a completely different life once they get through those doors? You know, what kind of a life are people living in the community? And behind your closed doors at home? You know, 
We have to live in the world. However, we do not have to be good friends with the world. And what I mean by this, you know, I have a lot of acquaintances outside the church. I do. I have an awful lot of acquaintances outside the church. Well, what do I mean by acquaintances? Well, they're people I know. And I think you do too. How many of you know people outside the church? I think we all do, don't you? Okay, we all know people outside the church. Listen, I look at them as my acquaintances, not my good friends. My good friends, I'll invite over to my house. I'll go over to their house. I'll take them out for dinner. They'll take me out for dinner. I like that part. I don't have to pay. Amen? But listen, those are good friends. You know, my good friends, I'll do anything for. I will. My acquaintance, maybe not so. What we need to realize is we need to have a distinct difference between our friends and our acquaintances. And we need to distance ourselves from our acquaintances and have good fellowship with our friends. The fourth thing is this. I'm almost done. And I've only got seven minutes left. <clears throat> I want to look at verses 17 and 18 together for a minute. And I want you to see if you can see what I saw in these two verses. And I want you to underline these verses. In fact, I want you to underline all of them from 14 to 18. But I want you to put a footnote or whatever between verses 17 and 18. And I want to show you something here. I want to teach you something today that I saw in here that I'd never seen before. Wherefore, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be, a son, be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Now, the first part of verse 17 says this. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Now, you notice what's behind thing. A semicolon, right? Okay, that is a complete thought. And I want you to think about that thought for a minute. You know, this, believe it or not, is a command. It is not a suggestion. I want you to understand that. This is a command, and it is not a suggestion. Paul doesn't say, well, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch nothing. He says, no. He says, wherefore? Wherefore? This is a command. Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Now, I want to look at the second part of that. Now, where that semicolon is, I believe, should have been the end of verse uh, 17. And then this should have been the beginning of verse 18. But I was not the one who wrote the Bible. So, I'm going to put it in anyway. But then look what he says. I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay, now you Bible scholars, what is that called? Those two parts of that verse, what is it called? What is it called? A what? A conditional command. A conditional command. A conditional command. You remember when we were studying the Old Testament, how God would give the Israelites certain things. If you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. Those were conditional commands. Those were conditional things. He has conditional and unconditional things that he tells us that we need to look at. Salvation is unconditional. If we call upon the name of the Lord we shall be saved. I mean, that's unconditional. Now, look at this verse. It's a conditional promise. 
If you look at the first part of it, he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. You know, he's saying here that we need to do something. What do we need to do? We need to be separate. If, 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 if you are separate, then I will do this. Then I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be sons and daughters. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I want God to be my father. Not only do I want him to be my father, but I want to be one of his sons. This is the cool part about that verse, ladies. And you need to underline this score, put it in parentheses, highlight it, whatever. Look what else it says in there. And, you know, very seldom do you see this. It says, and ye shall be my sons and daughters. He's talking to women. Woo! You guys can be daughters of God. Man, if that ain't exciting, I don't know what is. You very seldom do you ever see that. You can see sons all over the whole Bible. But very seldom do you ever see daughters. You know, I, I got to reading that, and I thought, man, alive, this is so cool. Even women can be in this. That's unreal. But, you know, what we need to realize is this in conclusion. You know, I could have used many, 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 many other verses. In fact, I think I had 52 verses that I had written down. 52 that I was going to use in this message. And as I was doing it, it would have lasted two hours or three hours before I got through it all. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to give the highlights of it and go that way. But I won't allow people outside the local church to become leaders of this church. You know, I could have used many other verses to prove my point on separation. I could have used many other verses to show my, my point on being yoked together. But I just wanted to make my point this morning. You know, it's not my preference to take stands on who is in the leadership of the church. However, I am bound under the word of God who can be leaders in this church and what leadership roles they can take. You know, we need to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We need to be careful who we let teach our children. We need to be separate from the world system. And listen, being separate is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. You know, God commanded us that we need to be separate. We need to be a peculiar people. We need to keep our lives totally separate. Now, all you know why I'm doing the things I do here. <laughs> you know, you have a little better idea why when I say, no, they can't do this because, and you can say, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember that message that you preach now. When I see something that I don't like or see someone who's doing things contrary to the word of God, or that their life is not showing spiritual growth, it's time for me to have a chat with them, and they may have to be removed from whatever role they have in the church. What we need to realize is the church has got to be as pure as what we can have it. You know, the church is not some social club where we come on Sunday morning and gather together and say, hey, oh man, it's good to see you guys, you know what I mean? And believe me, I've been in churches like that. But when I see something or something that is not the way it should be, I have to address it because I am the pastor of this church. 
Do I like to do it? No. I hate to do it. That's one of the worst things that I have to do in the church is to take and talk to people about their personal lives. If you are not sure that you're saved, you need to be. You know, a person who is not saved is already separated from me. I hate to say it that way, but you are. And you can't be yoked with me because you're not like I am. You need to make sure that you're saved. You know, there's no greater joy in my life than to know that I am a son of God. You know, Paul was very explicit about what he said, about how we need to be in our own personal lives. He's talking to the church of Corinth, and I understand that. And the church of Corinth, if you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, you see the church of Corinth was not a good church. It wasn't. In fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul retro, uh, um, gave him scolding through the whole thing. He did. Yeah, I mean, they were doing everything wrong. I mean, they were letting fornication come into the church. They were letting... Uh, they were doing the Lord's Supper completely wrong. They were doing everything in the church wrong. But they changed. When he wrote the book of 2 Corinthians, he's showing them because they changed what's going to happen and what God is going to do to bless that church. That's why I like the, church, the book of 2 Corinthians. Because 1 Corinthians, Paul gave instruction of what they needed to do to change. They changed. In the book of 2 Corinthians, he gives them an attaboy for what they did. You know, I don't know about you, but I can hardly wait to get to heaven. Hear the words, well done, now good and faithful servant, you are faithful to the end. Enter thou into the glory of my salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct us. Help us, I pray, that we can realize that we are not our own, that you are. And Father, I just pray now that you'd help us to not be yoked together with unbelievers, that we'll take and keep ourselves separate. Help us to realize that we need to be so careful about what we do. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll continue to guide and direct even now in this invitation. With every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, preacher, if I were to die right now, I'm not 100% sure where I'd spend eternity. Would you pray for me that I might know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die right now, I'd spend it in heaven? Does anyone like that? Quickly, quietly, just raise your hand. Maybe there's someone watching today on live stream. You're saying, preacher, that's me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Well, you need to make sure today. The Bible says that we're all sinners. The Bible says there's a penalty for our sin. The Bible says that we need to call upon the name of the Lord and we can be saved. All you need to do is just pray and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I realize there's a penalty for my sin. I accept you to be Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, man. If you take and do that, then there's a transformation made in you, and you're born again. We need to realize that each of us need to be born again. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, preacher, I've not lived a separated life. I have not been living my life the way I should. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone like that? Quickly, quietly. Yes, hands all over the auditorium. God bless you. <clears throat> Father, you've seen the hands, you know the hearts. I just pray for these that need to take and live a better separated life. Father, all of us need to take and live a better life, but I just pray, Lord, that you give them the strength to realize that they need to live a separated life for you. I just pray now that you'll guide them, direct them, help them. I don't know what areas they need help in, but I know you do. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help them and guide them. 
I just pray now that you'd be with the rest of the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand our hymnals turn number 164. Sixty-four. Room at the cross for you. upon which Jesus died is the shelter in which we can hide and his grace so free is sufficient for me and deep in his fountains as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still room for one Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Verse 2. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Let's do verse 3. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Amen. Closing prayer. All right. Father God, we thank you for this uh, this day, God, and for your wonderful message. Um, thank you for using the pastor and Mrs. Storm and, and all the people here, Lord. Thank you that our congregation had it swelled up a little bit today, God, and we just thank you for that. Uh, please help us to find more to come in and, and to share the, the gospel with, Lord God. We love you so much. We ask that you, you watch over us and you bring us back as often as we can, Lord. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.